Hello everyone. Today I wanted to do something a little bit different and I wanted to do something that could be more helpful to cases that either don't have that much information or no one's really talking about. Every year around 600,000 people are reported missing in the United States and only a handful of those cases blow up online. But how about the others? Because they deserve to be talked about just as much as any other case. I believe that they deserve help too. So today we're going to be talking about five cases out of the hundreds of thousands of missing people out there right now. And we're going to be taking a deep dive into some unsolved missing persons cases with the series that I wanted to start. Cases that don't have that much information. Again, no one's really talking about, so hopefully we can help spread the word on these cases as well. I ended up coming across the Missing Persons Center as well as the Charlie Project on another case that I was working with. And I started scrolling through the pages on there and there were endless amounts of faces and names that I had never heard of before. And I think these people also deserve recognition just like all of the other cases that blow up and some of these cases i don't know why they haven't blown up because there is some really interesting details in them so with that let's jump into this the first case we're going to be talking about today is the disappearance of 31 year old diana rose alejandra garcia gonzalez diana was born december 21st of 1987 and would eventually become a mother of five children now after diana's husband and father of her children had gone to prison diana ended up starting a relationship with a woman named danielle Meaden, aka Danny, and she began living in Winter Haven, California, which is right around the border of Yuma, Arizona, where her husband and children would later live. And it seems that Diana also ended up losing custody of her children some way, somehow. So she didn't have custody of them. She ended up living with Danny and that's where the story starts out. And at first I was really confused why she would go and move so far away from where her children were considering she was living in California, but her children were in Arizona. But then when you look at like geographically how these towns place, they're literally like a five minute drive away from each other just because it's right across the border from the other. It wasn't really that far away from some of her family and her children. She was right nearby, but from what we will learn, things were not good in where she was in Winter Haven. Diana was last in contact with her family on April 29th of 2020. So right around when the pandemic had started. And I think that could be a big factor in this case now that I really think about that. Like the pandemic had just started, people were all isolated and what we will find out, it kind of makes more sense now to me. And as months passed and no one heard from Diana, her mother began to get worried and began calling around to family, seeing if any of them had had any contact with her, but no one had. And from what her sister has said, it seems like she had family farther away in California. So her sisters and her family that were closer by, she would contact a lot more and not contact the family farther away as much. But because of this whole like no one really hearing from her, it wouldn't be until June 30th that Diana's aunt Jenny, who lives in Arkansas, would file a missing persons report with the police in California. It would take that long. Now, once police began to investigate, they realized that Diana had left her purse, cell phone, and other belongings behind, which we've heard in every single one of these cases by now, and we know it's never a good sign. No one's just going to run away or go on a solo trip or whatever without at least one of those items. And police also believe that Diana actually went missing around early May of 2020. Now, what do we know? Well, Diana was known to have frequently traveled between Winter Haven and Yuma, Arizona, as well as Mexico, but no one has spotted her, which in my opinion, with all her belongings being left behind, might make me believe that she was met by foul play. And I say this because Diana's family also agrees that she would not have walked away without any contact to her family. And from what the family has said, as well as court records, Diana and her girlfriend Danny's relationship was a volatile one, making statements that Danny was charged with attempted murder, but then was let out. Diana Gonzalez disappeared back in May, more than six months ago. Relatives say she was living with her girlfriend, Danielle Meaden, at the home they shared in Winter Haven. Today, I spoke with Diana's mother. Oh my daughter, she's got a strong, a strong woman. I just miss her so much. The search is on for missing woman Diana Gonzalez. More than six months after her disappearance, family and members of the community came out in hopes of finding the mother. She does have children I'm aware of, and um, I just really hope that um, this family can find some closure. In the past, ICSO has been in contact with Meaden for questioning, but family and those who know her say she's laying low. Meanwhile, Diana's mother is hoping that law enforcement will dig deeper into her daughter's case. I don't think the people here, I don't think they're doing their job right. I really don't. If something really did happen to my daughter, they could have prevented that from um, the first time they took Danny in for 
um, that that charge of my daughter. Uh, that charge, attempted murder. Although the Imperial County Sheriff's Office is still searching for Diana, the family thinks they aren't doing enough. My daughter would have been here right now, but they let her out. They let her out and all kinds of things. I don't know why. And I did some digging, and this claim actually seems to be true. This article from August 13th of 2019 reading, and I quote, a 30 year old woman was arrested for attempted murder by sheriff deputies at 10:30 PM Saturday at an undisclosed location on Foster road. Arrest records stated Danielle Meaden was booked into jail for corporal injury of a spouse or cohabitant violating parole and was held on a $500,000 bail end quote. Meaning Danny was also on parole when she did this. So what did she do to be on parole for to begin with? Now, Diana Zan Online has also claimed that Danny beat a 90-year-old. So this person, in my opinion, does not seem like a good person. Seems like a very violent person that Diana was living with. From what I've seen, they were actually living on a trailer in a reservation that was kind of in the middle of nowhere. On top of that, if we keep in mind, it was the pandemic so they were even more isolated than ever. And we also have to keep in mind that Diana was missing for a good few months before her aunt ended up calling and reporting her missing, which means Danny never reported her girlfriend missing, a girlfriend that lived with her. Now, according to Diana's sister, Crystal Gonzalez, who did an interview with Jason Hebert, she had made it seem like Diana had at one point gotten away from Danny. She was getting her life together. She even had a job interview at Target, but then, Danny swept her back into her web and she went back to Danny. And we see this happen a lot with DV relationships. There's like a certain number of times that someone like leaves a person before they finally will leave a person. I can't remember the statistics, but it's something that's well known that like it takes multiple different attempts to leave someone when you're in a DV relationship before you finally get out. And in my opinion, that seems to be what was happening between Diana and Danny. Now, a lot was said in this interview that Crystal did with this YouTuber. In this interview, Jason also said that Danny's friend Julie had messaged Crystal on Facebook saying that she had last seen Diana on May 9th at Danny's trailer and that Danny was abusing Diana and said that if Diana didn't leave, Danny was going to kill her. What really happened then? That night, when I talked to Julie after she sent the text on Messenger, she um, she told me that she went to the trailer and went to go see because I believe Danny or it was my sister that called her down there. So she went and I guess she was with her husband and my she got she had my sister in the trailer on a chokehold, and um, Julie said that she had to forcefully grab Danielle off of my sister and push her to the wall and she kept having to do that and um, her husband grabbed her and I guess Julie said that she ran out the trailer with my sister but Danny grabbed, Danny somehow got out the trailer and kept pushing my sister down to the ground saying that you're not going anywhere you're not doing anything and Julie if you call the cops I'm going to kill your sister I'm going to kill Diana so and then after that, I guess Julie and her husband took off and then called the police. And um, I don't know what else happened after that. Now, on top of that, a few days prior, it turns out that on May 4th, Danny contacted Diana's sister, Hilda, asking if she had seen Diana, saying that she hadn't seen her. So that leaves us to wonder if this whole story with Julie is true, if Danny was looking for Diana on May 4th. But then a few days later, she was back in the trailer and then her friend Julie seen them. I mean, it's possible. It definitely is. Or does that mean that this whole story that Julie is telling is false and Danny actually was calling around trying to kind of create an alibi? Like, I don't know where Diana went um, when she actually allegedly did have something to do with it because we've also seen people do that before. Now there's also a lot of alleged claims as well in this case. There's a lot of rumors and a lot of just strange things, such claims that Danny made comments to neighbors and her ex-husband that she killed Diana. And apparently Danny also had four children as well. And there's allegations that Diana is actually buried in the backyard of a woman named Kelly and Kelly ended up caring for three of Danny's four children. June 22nd, Diana's sister Hilda allegedly received a message from Diana's Facebook saying that she was okay and in Mexico, but the family doesn't believe that Diana sent that message from her Facebook. They think that Danny had access to Diana's Facebook and was sending people messages from it. Now, on top of all of that, a week and a half after Diana was reported missing, 
Kelly's home mysteriously burnt down. Kelly also told Diana's sister, Crystal, that Danny would allegedly tie Diana up and refuse to let her leave the trailer. Meaning if that's true, she was holding Diana hostage in that trailer. And again, with the pandemic happening, I could really see this being a possibility. We've seen a huge spike in DV cases and stuff like that happening during the pandemic when everyone was isolated. And I, this just feels like the perfect storm for something bad happening. Then there's also the story about a knife that Danny gave Kelly's son that also went missing. Then it was allegedly found and then it went missing again, but she never told police and it was this whole mess. Meanwhile, it is said that police have searched Danny's trailer multiple times, but only Diana's belongings were found as far as we know. It also turns out that this trailer that Danny was living in with Diana was on an Indian reservation and it was owned by a man named Ed and the family believes that Ed knows more than he's saying. Now, thankfully Diana's children are currently safe with their father in Yuma, Arizona, but that leaves us to wonder what happened to Diana. Where is she? Is she even alive? Why are there so many different stories being told to the family about what might have happened? There's stories of Diana being stabbed. There's stories of Diana being burned alive, that she's buried in the backyard of this Kelly lady. The list goes on. And in my opinion, it feels like the family's being tortured by all of these people that knew Diana telling them all of these different scenarios. And it makes me wonder what are the police doing to solve this case? Because if the last person that should have seen Diana alive also didn't call the police ever reporting her missing, you think that this would be kind of an open and shut case. Cause again, if Diana was living with her girlfriend and her girlfriend was innocent, why didn't she call the police when she went missing? Why did it take months for a family member in a whole different state to have to report her missing? I also wonder why the father of her children didn't report her missing considering I mean, she didn't have custody of them, but you think she would have contact her young children from time and again, but I, we don't know the details on that. I don't know if she was estranged from them or what was happening, but I'm sure she loved her children. And I don't think the father of her children had anything to do with this. I'm just confused by the dynamics of everything happening here. Like why they wouldn't also question like, why isn't mom calling us? Why isn't mom talking to us? Where's mom? But maybe she wasn't in contact with that part of her family and her children and they didn't find it odd she didn't talk to them for months at a time. I mean, I could guess I can understand that, but it's the girlfriend Danny not reporting Diana missing that really gets me. And then all these claims of abuse happening. There's literally arrest records of her being arrested for violently attacking someone in the home that she's in a relationship with. But it's been nearly three years now and Diana has still not been found. Where is she? What happened to her? Why isn't there more information on this case? Why isn't this case bigger than it is? This is a very interesting case. In my opinion, from what little we know, I think Danny allegedly did kill Diana during a DV incident. It's either that or Danny has had her locked up somewhere all this time because she wanted to control her. It seems that she used to tie her up from the allegations that we've heard. So I wouldn't find it weird if she has some far away place out in the desert somewhere that she has had Diana locked up all this time. And I can also kind of see that, that she might be alive somewhere considering the fact that there was no evidence of a bloody murder happening in the trailer or you think the police would have found that. Either way, this is a really strange case and I really hope that if Diana is alive out there somewhere that she can be found. At the time of her disappearance, Diana was five foot three and around 250 pounds. She is of Hispanic descent with brown eyes and natural brown hair that she occasionally liked to dye light brown or blonde. She has several tattoos, including the name Gavino on her right ankle, the name Jose on her left side of her upper back, the names Isabel, Valerie, Evelyn, Michael, and Nathaniel written horizontally down her right arm and the word Chamucho and in the inside of her right wrist and a queen of heart symbol on her left ring finger. If you have any information on Diana, disappearance or where she may be, please contact authorities. I will have the information linked down below. The next case we're going to be talking about is of 29 year old Matthew Tyler Henry, who has been missing for five years. April 15th of 2018, Matthew went missing in Dunlap, Tennessee. And at this point, police believe that this is a homicide case and that Matthew was met by foul play. Matthew was last seen in a convenience store on State Route 28 near the intersection with Rankin Avenue, as well as in a tractor supply store parking lot across the street. He also drove a white convertible Ford Mustang that was later found in the parking lot. Chief Phillips saying, and I quote, he was last seen in the tractor supply parking lot getting out of his vehicle and getting into another vehicle. We've identified that vehicle and that person. He has interviewed a couple of times, but he hasn't disclosed anything, end quote. And it turns out that this mystery man is among several persons of interest in Matthew's case, a case where more than 200 individuals have been interviewed, yet Matthew is still nowhere to be found. The family actually filmed an episode with ID Discovery. However, the network decided not to air it for one reason or another, which is is heartbreaking and confusing. I seen on their Facebook pages, they were talking about it and they seem to be very distraught after having to 
go through all of the trauma of talking about their son who was missing. And then for whatever reason, ID just said, no, we're not airing it. So I don't know if there's something bigger here that their son maybe was involved with uh, that involves what happened to him where ID was informed not to air it. I don't know why they wouldn't air it if not, because you, you think they'd want to help this family spread the word on this case. And as far as I've seen, no one's really talking about this case, which is why we're talking about it here today. And this case is concerning. Matthew got out of his vehicle and got into someone else's car that the police have spoken to, but after he got into that vehicle, he was never seen again. So what did they do with Matthew? What happened to him after he got in that vehicle? Why did he get into someone else's vehicle? There's so many questions here. Matthew is a father who has a seven-year-old son out there who's growing up not knowing his father or what happened to him. He has parents and a family and friends who are confused and grieving and they just want justice. Henry's parents have not heard from him in over five years and they are raising his seven-year-old son. And it's past time for justice for, of course, the family, for the community, and most importantly, for Matt. And just because there's not that much information on this case doesn't mean his case deserves to be spoken about any less than any more sensationalized case. If this case got bigger, more information may come out. At the time of his disappearance, Matthew was 29 years old. He was five foot nine, weighed 170 pounds, and he has hazel eyes and brown hair. Dunlap police say that often the smallest leads can solve a case. So if you've seen Matthew or know where he is, please call Dunlap PD. I'll have all the information linked down below. Our next case is on a mother and her young daughter that went missing seven years years ago. 42-year-old Liliana Marino and her eight-year-old daughter Daniela were last seen around 12 p.m. on May 30th, 2016 in a Home Depot parking lot located at 13895 Okeechobee Road in Hialeah Gardens, Florida, just northwest of Miami. And their apartment was just south of the Home Depot in Doral near Northwest 41st Street and Florida Turnpike. Now it would only be a day after the mother and daughter's disappearance that their family in Columbia would end up contacting authorities because it turns out they would get a friend that was in the Miami area to try to get in contact with them after they hadn't heard from them and this person also couldn't find Liliana or get in contact with her. The last contact the family had with Liliana and her daughter was on May 30th, just around 11 a.m. And that's because they had spoken on the phone with Liliana because it was her brother's birthday. After that phone call, no one heard from the mother and daughter. When investigators arrived at the apartment to search, they found Liliana's vehicle was in the parking lot and her apartment door was locked. But once investigators got inside, they'd find that Liliana's purse was there, her cell phone was inside, as well as a meal that it looked like she was in the middle of preparing as if the two had just vanished. They'd also discovered that Daniela had not attended school the Friday prior. Now to speak about this case, we need to speak about Daniela's father. It turned out that Daniela had been conceived during an affair with a man named Gustavo Costano. And that day, after Liliana had spoken to her family on the phone, Gustavo ended up driving over to their apartment and he was going to pick them up. And we don't know why, we don't know what they were really going to do that day. But according to Gustavo, he showed up and Liliana was making lunch. When he arrived, she offered for him to have lunch with them, but he declined wanting to eat anything and told them to come to Home Depot with him. Now, Gustavo says that during this car ride to Home Depot, which wasn't very far away, him and Liliana got into a heated argument where Liliana said she wanted out of the vehicle. So he claims that he ended up dropping them off near the Home Depot parking lot. He then says that he drove to his warehouse that he owned, he did some work, and then he returned to the area where he had dropped them off, but they were nowhere to be found. The next day, Gustavo ended up calling Liliana's sister in Columbia asking if she had heard from Liliana, which she found strange because Gustavo had never called her before. And this is what led the family in Columbia to calling and reporting Liliana and Daniela missing. So obviously this doesn't look good for Gustavo and obviously he was a suspect. Liliana and Daniela were last seen on Memorial Day 2016. They live near Northwest 41st Street and the Turnpike in Doral. Gustavo told investigators then he dropped them off at a Home Depot along Okeechobee Road in the Turnpike. But that also means that our only suspect is also our only eyewitness. So. Is he reliable in saying what happened to them that day? Did anything he say happen even happen? Did he pick them up and take them to Home Depot to go to Home Depot? Why was he showing up the apartment? What happened? Now, according to Gustavo's lawyer, Liliana and Gustavo were merely co-parents who had known each other for years because they worked in similar industries. What those industries were, I'm not sure. They said, and I quote, there was no romantic relationship. I have not heard about any ongoing dispute between them and I've talked to his family members, end quote, which I, don't really believe his family members because I'm sure they'd want to protect him. But anyways, his lawyer went on to say that he's been cooperating, he's given up his cell phone, his car, and he's let them search his house, meaning the police. However, Liliana and Daniela's family have a whole different story. And I kind of 
want to believe this family story. Liliana's family stated Gustavo was married to another woman when Daniela was born and that he had only recently become involved in his daughter's life. They described Liliana's relationship with Gustavo as, and I quote, stormy, and stated that he'd threatened to hurt her or her family, all of whom live in Colombia, and that she'd contacted the Colombian consulate with concerns about Gustavo which you'd think that might be able to be backed up and we could probably find information on that or police could. Now, police and state wildlife officers have searched a nearby forest and wooded area, the canal behind the Home Depot, as well as a warehouse owned by Gustavo that he said he had went to that day, but there, there's no clues that have turned up. On top of that, Gustavo's warehouse is actually in the area where he supposedly dropped the Liana and his daughter off. And it was also conveniently burglarized shortly after they disappeared. And a neighboring business, which was called Discount Prince, was also burglarized at the exact same time. Now we need to talk about Discount Prince for a second because it turns out that Discount Prince had a closed circuit surveillance system and cameras installed at the outside of the building that probably would have captured whatever was happening over at Gustavo's warehouse. And it turns out when Digital Prince was burglarized, the only thing that was stolen from the property was a DVR, which is a digital video recording device, AKA the system that would have any of the information from those cameras that were facing Gustavo's warehouse. On top of that, the owner of Discount Prince has said that on May 31st, Gustavo had gone to the business, asked about the surveillance system and inspected the DVR that was later stolen. And on top of all of that, Gustavo's cellular phone records indicate that he was in close proximity to the warehouse at the time it was burglarized. Police also found paperwork relating to Liliana in a dumpster near the warehouse. So if you ask me, all of that is pretty damning, but it gets worse because a few days later on June 2nd, Gustavo would end up contacting a number of his relatives in Miami and the New Jersey areas, telling them that he loved them. He then gave them $5,000 as well as a new credit card to his ex-wife. And then he rented a van from Home Depot. Now at this point, police were scared he was going to unalive himself and they ended up putting a nationwide bolo out on him. And at 11.40 p.m., Gustavo would be located inside of his van in that same Home Depot parking lot he had rented the van from. And when officers began to approach him, he began to slash at his own neck with a box cutter. And because of this, officers ended up having to use a taser on him, but this taser actually ended up hitting him in the face and one of the prongs got into his eyes, which later made him lose his eye. Which honestly, I don't feel sorry for him if he is involved in this. And I say that because his lawyer is now trying to make him seem like he's a victim in all of this and he has been wrongfully looked into and then the police wrongfully attacked him. But this man was trying to slash his own throat with a box cutter after his baby mama and his daughter go missing. Like this is all leading in one place in my mind. I can't fathom why you would try to injure yourself in that way if you are not involved. You know, why would police find him trying to cut his own throat? It makes no sense especially since our only eyewitness that Liliana and Daniela were ever even in a parking lot or ever left their home alive or anything like that was Gustavo himself. And then on top of that, that video surveillance system magically goes missing like in perfect timing for Gustavo. And that makes me really wonder why Liliana would have left her purse and her cell phone at home if she was going to leave with Gustavo to go to Home Depot. I feel like there's something deeper here. I feel like he did something to them in that house or he kidnapped them from that house and then took them to his warehouse. And that's why he needed to go steal that surveillance footage because it would have captured whatever he did. And I honestly feel like this case is pretty solvable. I think this is one of those cases where they have the right guy. They just need some kind of evidence or the bodies to link it to him. I mean, however, there's always a chance that they're still alive out there, of course. And if they are, I definitely think it's worth looking at their photos right now so that we can hopefully find them and identify them. This is an age progression photo of Daniela, who would be around 15 years old right now. She's of Hispanic descent with brown hair and brown eyes. She has her ears pierced. This is her mother, Liliana, who is also of Hispanic descent with black hair and brown eyes. She has a large mole on her upper left arm near her shoulder, and her ears are also pierced. She's around five foot four and was around 170 pounds at the time of her disappearance. If you have any information, please contact the Miami-Dade police. I'll have their information linked down below. Now this next case is a very mysterious cold case from back in 1988 of a woman who has been missing for longer than she was alive. 32-year-old Rebecca Pauline Gary was last seen in her apartment in the 8300 block of Airline Highway in Baton Rouge, Louisiana on December 27th of 1988. 
At this point, she worked as a waitress and lived at this apartment with her 12-year-old daughter, Jamie, and she was raising her as a single mother because the father was not in the picture. But for some reason, Rebecca decided for the Christmas holidays of 1988, she wanted to send her daughter, Jamie, to Shreveport to spend time with family, but Rebecca wasn't going to go with her. And apparently her daughter found the strange as well, and she didn't want to go without her mother, and they actually had a fight about it at the bus station, but... Either way, Jamie was put on that bus and sent to Shreveport, and Rebecca stayed behind in Baton Rouge. This would be the last time that Jamie would ever see her mother. And as Christmas came and went, her family never heard from Rebecca. Rebecca didn't call to check in on Jamie. She didn't call to wish them Merry Christmas, and the family found this really weird. Fast forward to December 27th, this day, Rebecca ended up calling her sister Joyce and told her that things weren't working out there and she wanted to come back home. Rebecca had grew up in the Shreveport, Louisiana area with her siblings and her mother. Her father had passed away when she was just six years old and it just seemed whatever was happening in Baton Rouge, Rebecca just wanted to go back home. So Joyce says that she ended up calling a friend in Baton Rouge who she asked to go reach out to Rebecca and help her get back to Shreveport. But after this phone call, Rebecca was never heard from again. It's unclear what happened to Rebecca or if that friend ever even went to check in on Rebecca. And as the first week of January came and rent wasn't paid, Rebecca's apartment manager, Beverly Worthy, ended up calling her sister Joyce to say that rent was due, but Rebecca wasn't answering her door. Obviously concerned, Joyce ended up giving the property manager permission to go inside of her sister's apartment. And when Beverly went inside the apartment, Rebecca was not inside. However, all of the lights were on, the coffee maker was on, the bathtub had been filled with water, and there were also two cups on the counter. Inside, Rebecca's driver's license would also be found, along with her purse, car keys, and cigarettes. A packed suitcase was also on the bed, and family photos were spread across the bed as if she was packing to leave. But there was also an autographed photograph of Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards that was found torn up. Now, at this point, Beverly was threatening to throw all of Rebecca's belongings out on the street because she hadn't paid her rent. But Joyce begged her to not do that until the police came and investigated. But the thing was, the police never came and investigated. It seemed like they kept insisting that Rebecca was gonna come back, that she had just run away, blah, blah, blah. We've heard this story over and over again. Police weren't taking it seriously, basically. And weeks later, when Beverly went to evict Rebecca, she still wasn't there. But at this point, the power company had shut the lights off and all of the things inside of the apartment were still in the same places that they had been left. Now, I've seen a few different stories of what exactly happened here, but from the story that I've seen that's most recent that is apparently from like police files, Beverly Worthy ended up becoming concerned. She found an address book next to Rebecca's nightstand and then she used that to find a phone number for Rebecca's brother who she ended up calling. And when she called Rebecca's family, none of them had heard from her before Christmas, it seems like although there was that phone call on the 27th. So I was kind of confused by that. Either way, no one had heard from Rebecca. Her daughter was still in Shreveport and that she'd never gotten her. And this is when the police would finally be contacted again and they'd finally come take a look at the apartment. Investigating officer Barry J. Parrish arrived just before 5 p.m. on Saturday, January 14th of 1989. Officer Parrish found no evidence of forced entry and the apartment counter and table appeared coated with undisturbed dust. When he ended up speaking to neighbors, he learned that Rebecca frequented the Waffle House at 7664 Airline Highway. And when he ended up going there, he ended up interviewing a server named Karen, who ended up saying that Rebecca and her daughter Jamie ate there at the diner daily until mid-December, but no one had seen them after that, which would line up with when she ended up sending Jamie to go stay in Shreveport. And it seems that Rebecca's apartment would remain untouched until her brother Glenn Gary arrived from Mississippi to collect all of her belongings. It seems that the police didn't collect anything from there for as far as I've seen because they sent the brother to collect everything and he collected her belongings on January 19th of 1989. And again, this is strange to me because you think that it would be the police's job to collect evidence, but I guess it's the 80s, things are different in the 80s. And this police force just seemed to not really care in my opinion, considering they didn't come for so long to even look into her being missing. And then when they did they let her brother collect all of this evidence because it turns out the brother ended up collecting her clothing, the suitcase, prescription bottles, Edwin Edwards campaign posters and pins, several business cards, tax and insurance papers, a driver's license, one pair of men's underwear size 34 to 36, some frame photographs and a typewriter. And Glenn ended up providing the police with Becky's purse, which they logged into evidence. Her pocketbook had no money in it, only documents. It basically seems that her brother went and collected all of this stuff and ended up giving it to the police after. I don't know why they didn't collect it. It seems like 
whole mishandling of this case. Maybe they could have solved it if they had investigated properly, but that's just my opinion. On February 15th, Detective Larkin would end up calling Jamie at her Aunt Joyce's home, and Jamie told investigators that her mother had been dating a man that she did not like for at least a year. She didn't know much about him, except that he knew Governor Edwin Edwards and had taken Rebecca to meet him in New Orleans. According to Detective Larkin's report, Jamie noticed her mother having some sort of problems in early December, acting nervous, even paranoid. She said that during this period, an unidentified man visited her mother. They sat in the living room of the apartment. From her room, Jamie overheard parts of the conversation. The man said that someone soon would kill Edwin Edwards for not repaying money, a loan from someone important. And this will kind of tie in with Edwin Edwards' later charges, which are really sketchy. Now, despite working as a waitress, Rebecca seemed to have an obsession with the prominent lifestyle. As we've seen, she was, according to her daughter, dating this man that knew the governor. She seemed to want to kind of put herself into that category of person. And according to Rebecca's daughter, Jamie, she believed that her mother was obsessed with Governor Edwards and was having an affair with him around the time of her disappearance, but was planning to end the affair. Not only was she allegedly dating a friend of Edwin Edwards, there's all these theories that she was actually dating the governor himself. And if this is true, it would kind of make sense if things weren't working out with her and the governor and there's these people coming to her house saying that the governor's gonna be murdered and all of the stuff she had gotten herself entangled in. If that's why she sent her daughter away because she didn't want her daughter involved in any of this. And then when she realized that shit was really hitting the fan, she called her sister and told her she wanted to come home. However, Governor Edwards would deny having any involvement in Rebecca's disappearance. He also denied having a romantic relationship with her whatsoever. He did, however, turn over several letters that Rebecca had written him. And I remember how there was allegedly a man that said that Edwin Edwards was gonna get murdered because he owed someone a large debt. Well, it turns out that the governor wasn't that great of a person because in 2001, he would be convicted of unrelated charges of racketeering, money laundering, and conspiracy and sentenced to 10 years in prison. So there is that. Clearly, he was doing some shady shit. So the fact that Jamie says she heard this man talking that he was going to get murdered makes sense to me. On top of that, it was apparently really well known that Governor Edwards was also known as a womanizer and he had a nickname of the Silver Zipper, which is disgusting. Family also says that Rebecca carried around a large manila envelope that she hid under her bed when she was home and that Anytime she wasn't home, she had it on her. And she'd actually told her mother that if anything happened to her, the family should get this manila envelope and look at what was inside of it. However, this mysterious envelope that the family claims Rebecca always had mysteriously went missing and it was not in Rebecca's apartment when it was searched. Now this case seems really daunting and that Rebecca may have been killed because of a secret which she was involved with the governor and all of this stuff. However, her daughter, Jamie, is still searching for her mother till this day and believes that there's a possibility that she left voluntarily in 1988 and that she's still somehow alive out there, but I don't know. Things would take a turn, however, when an anonymous caller would call and confess to murdering Rebecca at the request of the governor. According to the documents, the caller ended up supplying the victim's full name and date of birth and gave directions to a Spanish town road where he claimed that he left the body in the trunk of a brown Ford LTD. Now. I don't think they ever found this car or if they did, there was no body in the trunk because obviously this case would be solved. Now there's a bunch of other stories of men that Rebecca was involved in. And on April 12th, Bob Williams, who is Rebecca's employer at the time of her disappearance, told investigators that Rebecca did not pick up her last paycheck. He said that she seemed paranoid the month before she vanished and once came into the business with bruises on her face and arm. At the time, he said Rebecca dated a truck driver named James Stewart, who lived in the same apartment complex. However, investigators could never find this James Stewart. But according to her boss, before she dated this James Stewart, she had bragged about dating at least two married police officers. So I don't know what Rebecca was involved in, but apparently it wasn't good. And in my opinion, if she was dating married police officers and all of this drama with the governor and blah, 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 she clearly wasn't in anything good. And clearly this case seems to have been left to go cold, kind of like the Keddie Cabin murders, in my opinion. So. Maybe the police were reluctant to look into this one because maybe they were involved as well, but... But this one is a real mystery in my opinion. And I think it has all of the aspects that could make this a huge case. And I don't know why no one's really ever talked about it. I've never heard of it at least. There's so many questions like what was going on in Rebecca's life that she sent her daughter away? What had her so preoccupied and what was so important that she didn't even call her family on Christmas to wish them a Merry Christmas? And she never even called to check up on her daughter. And when she did call, she said she wanted out of Baton Rouge and wanted to go back to Shreveport. So something bad was going on and she was clearly alive around Christmas time where she could have called her family, but she didn't. 
because she ended up calling her sister days later. But it seems that this phone call that she made might not have been placed from her own home because the police allegedly know what the phone number was that she made that call on, but they won't release the details. So she might not have made that call from her home at all. And again, it seems that police never really investigated this case properly, especially since Rebecca's brother cleared out the apartment and had to send the police evidence and then leads were never followed up on. It's just a mess. The governor actually ended up dying in 2021, meaning that if he was involved in what happened to Rebecca, he took the secret of what happened to her to his grave. But if you have any information on this case or what may have happened to Rebecca, I'll have all the information linked down below that you can contact the appropriate authorities. Our last case today is going to be on a more recent case, and that is a 44-year-old Destiny Adams Cooper who may actually still be alive out there, unlike some of these other cases we just covered where it seems that the people are most likely not alive anymore, Destiny could be out there still. So I think it's really important we talk about her case. Destiny also disappeared from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but on May 3rd of 2022. And around the time of her disappearance, it seems that she was suffering from mental health problems, including severe PTSD, but it's not said what happened to cause this PTSD. She had actually been a teacher at McKinley High School for nearly 20 years prior to her disappearance and also co-founded a nonprofit foundation called Humanities Amped. She was also awarded the Angel Award by the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana Foundation in 2019 for her service to the community and for just being a great teacher. But for some reason, Destiny just decided one day to leave and she left her home without her phone, any money or any extra pair of clothing. Again, a trend we see in these cases, but in this one, it seems that Destiny left on her own accord. And there's not that much information on this case, but there are alleged sightings of Destiny around the areas of Baton Rouge, Hammond, and Amite, Louisiana. And when she was last seen, she looked to be extremely dehydrated and emaciated as if she wasn't getting enough fluids or nourishment. Something was really happening to her and it seems that the family feels like it was a mental issues. As you can see from this photo, she looks drastically different than she did before, where she looked healthy and happy. She looks like a shell of a person. And her loved ones do believe that she's out there somewhere and that she's living on the streets and is in grave danger due to her state of health. Her loved ones state that she may not recognize people and she may not realize that she needs help due to whatever is happening to her. And I think this is a good case to remind everyone that homeless people are people. Someone that you may see out on the streets out there has a whole story. They had a whole life before they were out there. And if Destiny is out there, she had an amazing life before whatever happened to her that led her to have the severe PTSD that led her to you know, end up where she is now. She was a teacher who was winning awards. She looked happy and healthy and she deserves to get help. It's advised that if you do see Destiny or find her to not confront her, to call 911 and try to take a photo of her. I'm gonna have Destiny up on the screen right now because again, there is a chance she is still out there and she does need help. Destiny is Caucasian with brown hair and brown eyes standing five foot three. She has a tattoo of the words, hope is a function of struggle and black script running up her spine, ending in a blue and green ink design just below the nape of her neck. And this is the photo again that was allegedly taken of her the day she disappeared appeared. I don't know how it was taken of her, but as far as you can see, she is not in a good state. She doesn't look like she used to. If you have any information on Destiny or if you have seen her, please contact the Hammond Police Department. I'll have it linked down below. But that brings us to an end today of these cases. Let me know if you like this format, if you want to see more possible videos like this, because again, there are an endless amount of names and cases that I could be covering for this. This is just five of hundreds of thousands. And I do think it's very important to talk about these smaller cases or cases that no one's really talking about. And again, all five of these cases I had never heard of before. And I just found clicking on the site and just taking a quick scroll. Some of them are new, some of them are older, some of them they could still be alive out there. And some of them, it seems that they may not be. But all of these cases, need to be solved. These families need closure. These victims need justice just as much as any other case. And again, I'll have all the links down below if you have any information that may help solve these cases. And I want to know how you feel about each one of these individual cases. So let's talk about them down below. Do you have any suspicions of what may have happened? Have you heard of any of these cases? So let's have a chat about it down below and please share the links if possible to help also spread the word on these cases or if you would like to share this video as well. As always, if you're not subscribed and you want to see more videos like this, I definitely recommend you hit the subscribe button and I hope you all stay safe out there, lock your windows and doors, and I hope to see you in the next.